Hi, welcome to the Tutoring Center's Bio 180 videos. Today we're going to be talking about electron orbitals. Now this is something that can be very difficult for students, mostly because it's really hard to visualize because um, it's just not something that is normal. But we're going to hopefully clarify any confusion today. So, first off, let's just review an atom really fast. So every atom um, or element is made up of three parts. It has electrons, protons, and neutrons. Protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and they together make up the nucleus. Electrons are negative, and they surround the nucleus in a cloud or in um, orbit. And so this is the model that we typically show initially. Um, this is called Bohr's model, but this model is actually oversimplified. It's actually a lot more complex than this because it's 3D and electrons don't just orbit in perfect circles all the time. And so the reason, I guess, is because of orbitals. Orbitals are the space that electrons are found 90% of the time. So they won't always be there, but the majority of the time you find them there. And it's a 3D space, so it's not just linear like a circle. It's all over going back and forth. So let's try to clarify the difference between a shell, a subshell, and an orbital. So a shell describes the distance or like the, the space outside of the nucleus. Um, so they're, they're classified by numbers, one, two, three, one being the closest, two being farther away. Subshells describe the shape of the orbital, and so we have S, P, D, and F. And then orbitals, are the space themselves where they're 90% of the time. Um, and there is 1s orbital, 3p, 5d, and 7f. Um, so let's try to make sense of this using this picture. This is a more accurate picture of what it looks like. Remember, it's also in 3d, so it even gets more complex than this. So the black dotted lines represent the shells outside. Um, the black dot in the middle represents the nucleus. It's kind of hidden. So the red circles represent S subshells. So in the first shell, we have just the S subshell. There's only one of them. So that's the space that electrons are going to be. And then in the second shell, we have one S subshell, or one S orbital. And then we have three P orbitals. So here's one. They make a dumbbell shape. And there's the third one. And so that's where the electrons are going to be 90% of that time. So then let's start figuring out how many electrons are in each cell. So an important rule to remember is that there are two electrons per orbital. It doesn't matter the size or the distance or the type it is. They all contain two electrons. So if we know there's one s orbital, that means the s orbital holds two electrons. There's three p orbitals. The p orbitals hold six electrons, f, 10, Sorry, D10, F14. And don't get too concerned about D and F because for the majority of biology, we're not going to get much more than the third shell um, and much more into Ds and Fs. So that means if we add them up, we talked earlier, the first shell only contains an S orbital. So there's only can be two electrons total in the first shell. The second shell contains two um, S and P orbitals. And so we know that two plus six is eight. And then the third shell contains s, p, and d orbitals, so 2 plus 6 plus 10 is 18. So this is where the octet rule comes into play. The octet rule tells us that atoms or elements like to have full um, outer shells. They like to have eight electrons in their outer shell. And if they don't have eight electrons, they'll do about almost anything to get it. They'll bond in certain ways, and that's important when you talk about chemical bonding. Now this rule, there's an exception, two exceptions, and that's for hydrogen and helium because their outer shell only contains two electrons. So for everything but hydrogen, helium, and helium, they want eight electrons in their outer shell. Valency versus valency. So I said earlier that uh, the outer shell, the outer shell can also be called as the valence shell. And so valence describes the number of electrons in that outer shell or valence shell. And valency describes the number of electrons that need to be added to satisfy the octet rule. For oxygen, as an example, we know that oxygen has eight electrons because its atomic number is eight. Therefore, we see that two fill the first shell because of this, and then the remaining six will be in the second shell. That means 
that oxygen has six valence electrons and it has a valency of two because it wants two more electrons to satisfy the octet rule. You'll have to know this um, when you get into chemical bonding. You'll need to know how many electrons an atom will want to satisfy the octet rule. Now we're going to talk about electron configuration. Electron configuration is just a way that scientists classify and show how the electrons are filling in a shell. And so electrons are lazy. They like to be at the lowest possible energy state. And so they're going to fill the lowest energy first. And so those are the ones that are closest to the nucleus. So to write an electron configuration, you start off with the shell, the first shell it's going to fill in, and then the orbital or subshell, and then how many electrons fill in it. So for S, the max is two. Then we're going to go to the next one. So the next one's the second shell. So we're going to write two. It's going to be S again, and the max is two. Then we're going to go to P because there's a P um, subshell in the second shell. And so because there's a P subshell, we know that that's three orbitals. So three times two is six. So the max it can fill is six. But wait a second. We only need seven electrons because nitrogen's atomic number is seven. Two plus two plus six is actually 10. So we have three extra electrons. So this number actually is going to be three. So when you add all the superscripts up together, it should equal your number of electrons that you have. Let's try another one with phosphorus. So it's gonna start off the same. We're gonna have one S2, two S2, two P6 this time, because we have 15. Then we're gonna go to three S. We're gonna go into the third shell, three S2. And then we're gonna go three P3, because 2 plus 2 plus 6 is 10, and then plus 2 is 12, and then plus 3 is 15. That's our 15 electrons. So if you ever get confused, here's the way that you um, fill the shells. This will be the order that you write your electron configurations. You write 1s first, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and keep going down. But for the most part, you won't get this far. Now something else I want you to take a look at is that nitrogen and phosphorus has similar endings to their electron configurations. They both have um, only filling three in their P um, subshell. And so anytime that you have atoms that are on the same row, they're going to, on the periodic table, they're going to have similar ending electron configurations. And that also means that they're gonna have similar valency or number of valence electrons. And because of that, these both, they have both three valence electrons because they need three more to satisfy their octet rule to be happy, they're going to react the same way. They're going to react with different things to try to get up those um, to that octet rule. Last thing I want to talk about is electrons jumping from uh, different shells. So if an electron uh, moves down to a lower shell, it's going to release energy. And if an electron jumps up to another shell, it's going to require energy. And that's going to be important for when you talk about photosynthesis. That's all for today. I hope it was helpful, and enjoy the rest of your day.